So today, uh, it gives me great pleasure to tell you about Near Metals, uh, particularly for our shareholders uh, and one of our directors that's here. Uh, I think Near Metals offers its shareholders unparalleled exposure to five of the six most positively impacted commodities in this new energy vehicle, you know, energy transition. Um, you know, we, that's our common intersect of our, our four core projects. We've pivoted away from the more carbon intensive traditional upstream mining. I mean, that's what we've sort of done in the past. Today I'll tell you about our uh, focus on the EU projects where we're looking to develop a couple of green critical materials there. Uh, we've got a team with a growing track record. Uh, obviously, we, were, uh, we developed Mount Marion. You know, we had a good outcome from that. We made sort of 200 million off a $3 million investment. We've still got about 80 million on the balance sheet. We've given 60 million bucks back to the shareholders and in the last five years, we've invested about $60 million into our projects. So I'll tell you about those today. Um, I'm probably only gonna have time to, to tell you about the lithium ion battery project. That's a business that we are developing with one of Germany's largest in engineering companies. Uh, and we're developing uh, what will be the world's, or the Western world's uh, largest battery recycling business. I won't be able to tell you about our vanadium project, uh, our recovery project, where we've got access to the highest grade vanadium stockpiles up in Sweden, a lithium refinery project, the world's second largest, or, sorry, second highest grade hard rock titanium deposit, or our 147,000 nickel metal tons in 11 sulphide deposits, 50 k's from Cambelda. Um, our board, uh, you can come and have a look at this sort of later. We've got a fantastic board that are the gatekeepers between management and the shareholders' money. Uh, they make it, us work for it. In terms of a corporate dashboard, uh, like I said, we've got about 82 million bucks in, in cash and investments, no debt. We're able to fund our projects through to FIDs. In fact, for the first battery plant, we've got enough money for that. Board and management are the largest shareholders in the company and we've started to get a bit of love uh, from the market, which is great. I won't invite you without, uh, to buy shares without speaking to your investment advisor, Joe. Uh, so just a bit on the uh, <laughs> just on the, the batteries. I mean, these electric cars, they're coming, not that you see it in Australia, but trust me, Europe, the US, around the world, it, it's just happening. And, uh, and so what we can do is, you know, it's, it's almost like Andrew Forrest saying that the Chinese were going to build the world's biggest amount of steel capacity and then just going out and getting iron ore assets. We can see the car makers are transitioning, we can see the battery plants that are getting built, you can only put a certain amount of stuff in there and you need lithium, you need graphite, you need nickel, you need cobalt, you need manganese. Um, and I won't forget aluminium because that's, that's in there as well as copper. So we just can't see where the supply is going to get to. If I have a look at all the undeveloped lithium projects, and I'm a reasonable arbiter of whether they can make it or not, having been there 12 years, I can see it's getting halfway there. That's if everything gets developed. So, you know, I think the, the upshot is that the commodities are just going to go up over the next decade. In the EU, they are leading this adoption. They're doing the carrot and the stick. You know, there are 6,000, 9,000 euro incentives for France and Germany. And if for the car makers, they've got the stick. If you don't meet the CO2 levels, it's a billion dollars per gram of carbon, above 95 grams of carbon per kilometre on your fleet average. So it's just happening. For a number of reasons, recycling shouldn't be optional, right? I mean, you can see that they're not safe to store. You see fires, and that's only the little batteries. Imagine what happens when they're big. Um, you shouldn't put it into landfill, you've got exotic base metal oxides, lithium, yeah, the lithium in the groundwater probably stops you from getting depressed and less crime, but the rest of it's a bit toxic. Um, today I'll tell you about, you know, take, it's a real opportunity to take the CO2 out of the supply chain because, you know, as much as the mineral guys like to say they can reduce the carbon, it's still heavily carbon intensive. Then what we've got to do is address these material shortages and circular economy. You know, we've got the Americans and the British here, and look, you know, we're going to have to buy material that's made in China, batteries. I know they'd like to force us to buy their cars, but we're probably going to get their batteries, their cathode active materials. We get them in, the last thing we can do is let them leak out, right? So we have to put up barriers. And so, you know, what people don't appreciate is this carbon shock from the EVs, right? You, uh, you drive an EV off the production line, it's got twice the carbon footprint as a normal car. That comes because of the electric battery and the battery supply chain. Uh, and so we've got to address that, you know. If we have a look at how much CO2 uh, is in, if we've got a tonne of batteries, there's eight odd tonnes of CO2 generated by raw mineral concentrates. Nickel, copper, lithium, what have you. 
If we use hydro, uh, pyromet recycling where they smelt it, I mean they incinerate the graphites, the plastics uh, and the lithium electrolyte. So they only get about 50% mass recovery and hence about four tonnes. And then what we're trying to do is with our hydromet recycling, we're not burning anything and we're trying to get down and strip out 90 to 95% of carbon out of that supply chain. And in the EU, which is where our demonstration plant and our first commercial plant will be, you know, they're bringing in, hopefully this August, after they've had a well-deserved summer, these new regulations into the EU, 100% mandatory recycling. Uh, CO2 footprint declaration. Uh, recycling efficiency is going from 45 to 65 to 70 by the end of the decade. In a year-long pilot plant in 2019-2020, we achieved recoveries of 85%. So we've got a future-proof process there. And then you're going to have to declare what your recycled content is. And then you're going to need minimum recycled content in new batteries. But that shouldn't scare anyone because even if I recycle every battery in Europe, and this is, well, I'll get to it. Uh, it'll be the second largest hub and then the second largest volume of end-of-life batteries. But even if I recycle every battery in 2030, that's only enough feedstock for 10% of production that year. So we're always going to need plenty, you know, just growing amounts of mineral concentrates. So we started developing this battery recycling process in 2016. You know, we were, the, the Minres guys uh, were building Mount Marion. We thought, right, yeah, the lithium, that's set, that'll get constructed. What is the commodity that's got the softest underbelly from a mineral economics point of view? And it was copper. Sorry, it was cobalt. And so, you know, immediately we tried to corner the market and buy the LME stockpile, which Macquarie said, no. You could only take it at a tonne a day for an orderly market. I thought, that's right, weird. So then I asked them to write me call options, and they wouldn't do it. And I thought, right, that's weird. So Dad said, well, you better go out and find where these cobalt deposits are. They're all in the DRC. I'm not brave enough for that. And then my COO held up my Apple phone and said, did you know the batteries in here are 20% by weight cobalt? And I thought, well, that's fantastic. Let's get the Mets onto it. So that was the genesis. So we're aiming to be the leading recycler for the cell makers and car makers. We've got two sizes of plant. I think, you know, if we have a look at the optimal size of these manga factories, Elon's led it. I mean, he's just done an unbelievable job. Uh, the factory, I mean, there's no IP in his mega factory, it's just a big shed, and then he has, he lands all the ingredients of production at the front end, then it goes to Sumitomo to make the cathode, then it goes to Panasonic to make the battery, and then they put it in a pack and send it to the car plant. So our 20,000 tonne plant will have the off-spec production, it's typically about 10% of the feed, and then we're going to scale that up to uh, capture the 90% of batteries that end up in cars at the end of their life. And so these 811 batteries, having a tonne of these NMC 811 batteries in 2030 is the best ore body in the world and I don't need to mine it, right? Having a tonne of these batteries is 15% nickel, 15% copper, 2% cobalt and 2% lithium. And once I put it in a leach solution, half of it doesn't leach. The graphite won't leach, so we filter it off. So essentially we've just developed a new nickel refinery that can handle batteries instead of mineral concentrates. Uh, we've got a proprietary process more around the, the back end refining. Uh, for those of you that are slightly interested, you can delve into that a bit later. Uh, I mean, the, the, the key takeaway is 85% recycling efficiency and nickel and copper so sulfates out of the SX without an IX cleanup uh, exceed the requirements for use in cathodes in China, which is the LME spec. And our tailings is a fertiliser feedstock. So rather than adding uh, you know, limestone and then soda ash and all the, the usual suspects, we've used ammonia gas and liquid ammonia as a pH adjustment and so we're left with an AMSOL tail that we can concentrate and sell as fertiliser. We put out an engineering cost study estimates, about 1,560 US per tonne of feed, about 165 million to build and this is the salient bit. If I've got lithium cobalt tape batteries, right, from Apple or someone like that, there's $11,000 worth of recoverable value in it. If I get the lowest value battery of NMC 811, there's about $5,600 per tonne. And that's using spot prices. So that's probably one of the best legal businesses I've ever seen. So to put it into perspective, it's essentially just, if you've got 811 batteries, you're a nickel producer with a cobalt and a lithium co-product credit. That's what it looks like at a high level. So if I take 100% of the site costs, I take the cobalt credit off only, and I put that over the contained nickel, I'm the new lowest cost nickel producer in the world below Nerilsk. 
uh, for producing nickel sulphate. The challenge then becomes, okay, well, how do you make it bigger, Chris? So how we made it bigger was we decided to do a 50-50 incorporated joint venture with one of Germany's largest, car, uh, largest engineering companies and fabricators of processing plants, right? So we're co-funding all, all the way up to uh, an FID. Um, we're constructing a showcase demonstration plant at their manufacturing headquarters in Hilkenbach, Germany. They've got 4,000 people there. We've got our own dedicated 2,000 square metre facility. We're evaluating both a 20 and a 200,000 tonne plant. Uh, they've got the right to build, own and manage and operate the plants uh, on behalf of the joint venture and best endeavours to procure 50% debt financing. They're the second largest generator of German government backed loans. You know, 150 years old, 14,500 employees, 95 sites around the world. And that's been fantastic for us. Um, not sure, oh yeah, this will work. There was sound, but you're not missing anything without having the sound. So this is what we're building uh, at the moment. It is materially complete and we will start dry commissioning it later this month, wet commissioning it next month. So we've got a, a 20,000 tonne shredding plant. Um, as we zoom in there, you can see the batteries that'll go into the shredder. Not sure there should be any 12 volt ones there, the big ones, <laughs> but notwithstanding. So, you know, we shred them in a wet atmosphere. We've got an inert shroud over that. Um, you know, we then sort of, We've got a screw conveyor there that pushes the rubbish up. The black mass that's got the cathode and anode uh, goes down into that little tub. We then separate out the plastics, uh, the aluminium, the copper and the iron, you know, foils and casings. So we take that black mass, uh, we then sort of screen it and send it over to a filter to take some of the water out of it check myself for time. Okay. Trust me, it works. <laughs> so we've got flexible business models. You know, I can't believe that at the moment we're actually tending and people are going to pay us to dispose of their batteries. That's unbelievable, but that's not going to last. So as the volumes get up, we're going to have to share the economic benefits in partnerships for the really, really big contracts. We'll look at licensing and supplying them the plant. So what that's enabled us to do is to develop a runway, not only our own plant for 20,000 tonnes in Germany to service the German battery making industry and car making industry, but we've done one in Japan, uh, an MOU with Itachi, they're probably the oldest trading house in the, in the sort of lithium supply chain. Uh, they make anodes, cathodes, they don't make cells, but they've got their own stationary energy storage battery. So we're evaluating putting a, a plant into Japan and then elsewhere through Asia. Uh, last week we announced that we're doing a deal with uh, the steel company in Canada, right? Three million tonne steel producer, uses 600,000 tonnes of scrap, wants to go straight to the car makers and get the cars. Pretty soon they're going to have batteries in them, right? So we're doing a 50-50 joint venture and it's great because we're not looking at 20,000 tonne plants anymore. These guys are doing 600,000 tonnes of scrap. That's hundreds of thousands of cars. So very, very excited about that. In terms of our timeline, uh, like I said, you know, we're at the point now where we're dry commissioning this month, wet commissioning this month, we'll run the demonstration plant. We've secured feed from that from German car makers, station energy storage makers. They come in, they see their batteries safely shredded, they take the product at the end, evaluate it and then look to offtake. Uh, we'll then put out the class three engineering cost study, uh, feasibility study and make an FID in the March quarter. It's about a 12 month build up because we already own the commercial front end. We've just got to scale the hydromet up. So, and look, you know, some guys that have got a very, very similar uh, flow sheet, uh, some guys that we know, we may have discussed this and they may have uh, got ideas off of us. I'll be talking to them tonight on the same conference. Fortunately, in London, I'm presenting before them, so I'll throw them straight under the bus. Uh, but it's good because they've just done a deal to get bought out for a billion US dollars. So I won't go through this project, even though it is fantastic, you can have a look at this at your own time, rather than being lowest producer, it's lowest quartile, which is still not really an issue. And so yeah, this is just, just reiterating for our shareholders, you've got exposure to graphite, lithium, cobalt, nickel from the battery recycling and the vanadium project. So you know, I think I'd like to offer our shareholders, I want them to feel secure, right? I mean, we've got a fantastic balance sheet, a consistent strategy, strong board and management, history of making money and giving it back to the shareholders over the last five years. This pivot away to ESG, we're not trying to carbon wash or green wash a, a high carbon industry. 
we've actually, you know, sort of shifted our portfolio focus to these more ESG recycling and recovery projects. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>